I do hate communism and I do love Jesus. But in the 1960s, I was uncertain about both. And I was more familiar with the writings of Chairman Mao than the words of Jesus. The truth is that beyond the politics and rhetoric of that troubled era, I just didn't want to take a government paid vacation to Vietnam. Let's face it, some of us were afraid to die. And besides, the food was bad and the haircuts were terrible. The establishment promoted the view that we were better dead than red. The government reminded us that we lived under the shadow of the red Soviet hammer and sickle. The communist bloc nations had grown across Eastern Europe and much of Asia. Russia was empowering Cuba, close enough to our shores to send cold waves across Miami Beach. And we all knew that a population explosion blanketed red China. Everything seemed to be tipping the scales toward the communist side of that Cold War. We were definitely defined by color codes. Full-blooded, patriotic, red, white, and blue stood firmly against the growing red threat. But some of us lived in a tie-dyed, rainbow-colored Woodstock world. And many of us just didn't want to be drafted into wearing a wardrobe of olive drab or show up in a jungle firefight on the evening news. Many of us were terrified of being forced to fight a war that only old white politicians believed to be worthy of our young lives. Political theorists worried that all of Southeast Asia would tumble into communism like dominoes if Vietnam fell, but some of us weren't good at dominoes. And adding to the confusion of the day was the fact that many of us had no idea what we wanted to do after graduating from high school. All we knew with confidence was that our Uncle Sam had a plan for us if we didn't stay in school. We understood that we needed a college deferment or we would be facing the draft. The military draft promised to provide us with both training and travel. It was like the old bumper sticker said, Uncle Sam was going to send us to see exotic places, meet interesting people, and kill them. That was the underlying reality of the military draft, and it was the most compelling reason for many young men who could afford it to immediately go to college. This led to clear-cut color and class distinctions. Black and white facts formed the cultural divide. If one's family was unable to afford higher education, those fellas typically received greetings from their local draft board and many got an all-expense-paid ticket to Vietnam. For the record, according to a Library of Congress report in the mid-1960s, African Americans comprised 12% of the U.S. population, yet they filled nearly 31% of the ground combat battalions in Vietnam. As a result, many argued that the war ended up being fought by a lot of poor black and brown men sent by rich white men to kill desperate yellow men. There were certainly exceptions, and the military did have patriots and volunteers too. None of those men should be forgotten, and all should have been honored. But as the war pressed on, the draft became a consuming issue for many of us. The generation gap was real. Vietnam, civil rights, Watergate, the Cold War, a host of problems across our nation culminated in events that created America's perfect storm. Social concerns, youth activism affected my generation very deeply. The inequities of life seemed to get amplified and impressionable baby boomers like me found many ways to voice our opinions. In the closing episode of this series, I want to present a novel observation of one long-lasting result of this perfect storm. In fact, I think I may have identified one more casualty of the war in Vietnam, one that has seriously impacted American life. But first, in this episode, I have prepared a very special musical presentation from that era. <laughs> no joke now. I first recorded the music you will hear in 1972. 
It was done shortly before I became a Jewish believer in a Jewish Messiah. When I wrote and recorded the song you're going to hear, I was making a strong, though satirical, social commentary about the difficult problems that were still being faced by many African Americans at that time. The civil rights movement had made progress, but there, there was still much needed change. Today, so many decades later, reverse discrimination and governmental DEI programs might be as big a problem as latent racism was then. I want to momentarily reflect on an old-fashioned racism that existed in America. I do understand that in some ways segregation continues to plague black and white relationships, I don't know, in manners that just shouldn't exist. And that was why in more recent years I decided to record a, a new introduction to my very old song. For the record, the music you will hear is straight out of a 1972 Sunset Strip recording studio in Hollywood, California. I hope we can still be friends when this is over. Please stay tuned and after the song, we'll talk. You know, a lot of things have changed since the 60s. Hairstyles, clothes, music, even our language has changed. But one thing hasn't changed enough. Anyone who remembers the 60s knows that integration wasn't a computer term back then. You know, it was church leaders who led the civil rights movement. What happened? How come the most segregated place in America seems to be the church? Why does religion divide so many people? You know, I could be wrong, but it seems to me that the success of the civil rights movement ended at the door of many churches. America seems to have two flavors of Christianity, vanilla and chocolate. Today we ride the same buses, eat at the same lunch counters, use the same drinking fountains, and Martin Luther King has a street named after him in every major city. But I still see an awful lot of unspoken color lines on Sunday morning. Now, I'm from Gary, Indiana. In 1965, I lived on 7th Avenue. This was the white side of the railroad tracks. The other side of the tracks was more than a cliche because it was downhill for a lot of folks who were the wrong color to make it uphill beyond 8th Avenue. But my life changed in 1965 on the other side of the tracks at the corner of 16th and Broadway in Jack's Pawn Shop. <laughs> yes, sir, I can still see the sign. Meet Jack, see Jack. <laughs> well, I wasn't selling that day, I was buying. I marched in with a few hundred dollars and left with a drum set, an electric guitar, and the biggest amplifier my dad could help me carry out of that store. It was a turning point in my young life because that day in 1965, I joined a rock and roll band. In a couple of years, everything changed around Gary. Busing, integration, Vietnam, the Jackson Five, a black mayor, and just a whole lot of things changed. After my high school buddies quit the band, I went out as a single. I wrote songs and tried to impact my generation by singing in coffee houses, bars, clubs, and yeah, even street corners or parks when they were the only place I could gather an audience. I sung about sex, drugs, and revolution until my world began to change and I found religion, or rather, religion found me. But a few months earlier, I read a great book by a fellow named Langston Hughes. He gave a name and a face to hopelessness. His character was called Jess B. Semple. Now, most white folks never met this simple black man of the ghetto, so I changed his name to Jess B. Not White in 1972, and I cut a record to introduce him to my friends. Some things never change. My name is Jess B. Not White. But my friends, they call me Simple. I'm an educated, renovated, just call me black Since I've come from Africa I've been lynched, freed, slaved, and evicted Now I'm gonna ask you one small favor Don't call me Jack If you care to know about my life Look at my feet They've broken windows in Harlem Riots turned around and walked in Harlem streets they told the tales to cotton bales and lines from soup to draft. 
Still my ears have had to hear Sonny move on back I live in the ghetto With no heat but lots of parks and ladies, no drinking, no smoking, no thinking, no company after dark. I've been working like a Negro all the way. Long breaks, long hours, full time half pay. I laughs to keep from crying, and I cries to keep from dying. Since I lost my shiny process. Nothing seemed quite right. Sometimes I wonder why I'm so frightful black When the Lord said shine a light And them white folks they shined it on I was Jim Crow on the buses The Lord missed me in the back I ain't gonna leave this place alive If the cold don't get me I'll die from the jive my time has come to leave, Lord, let me out loud. I live like a beggar, but I'll go down proud. I'd like to dedicate this song to Strom Thurmond and Mr. Trent Knott. I hope you stayed with me because you're interested in this stuff because I do have a lot more to tell you and none of it is easy peasy. I want to propose one long lasting detrimental side effect to the Vietnam anti-war movement and the battle lines that were drawn across America during the era of the civil rights movement. I think the chaos of the age corrupted the gene pool of America's academic DNA. Follow me on this one. You see, in the late 1960s and early 1970s, worlds seemed to collide, and many believed our society began to crumble. Black pain was hurled into the white comfort zone as the justifiable demands for equity and an end to racism was demanded. Powerless youth crashed into a political system controlled by old politicians who drafted young dissidents to die in a war many believed unworthy or unable to be won. Political theorists feared the red tide of communism would engulf the free world like tumbling dominoes after the fall of South Vietnam. It really was a collision course that could not be averted. The perfect storm I described was the culmination of a generation gap fueled by the winds of an unpopular war. As many have said, and I heartily echoed, the war in Vietnam was often fought by poor black and brown men, sent by rich white men to kill desperate yellow men. The battle cries were amplified by much needed societal, legal, and the political quest for genuine civil rights. The rampantly expanding drug culture Political evils such as Watergate, a sexual revolution, the Cold War, and a host of social concerns affected my generation very deeply. Anger and violence erupted everywhere. The inequalities of life seemed to explode into violent disagreements. Now, people today assume that the nation has never 
been more divided. Half the country hates one party, and the other half hates the other party. The only equality seems to lie in our division. We're equally divided through social media and by the fake news that has caused many to believe that the other side only hates. Love is gone. Nobody really votes for anybody. They seem to only vote against somebody else. And whichever party gets into power, well, the other guys believe that's the one that will destroy America. But believe it or not, it's possible that the late 1960s and early 1970s were even more divisive. It could have been a more chaotic time then than it is now. And let me tell you something, things have been worse. Let's stop to remember that a century before my generation was tearing up the nation, America had an actual civil war. Our nation has weathered division before, and we came through it. I believe with God's help, we'll weather the current storm too. But we should learn something from our experience. And if this really is the end of the world, perhaps we should all become better prepared spiritually to face it. I think it's time to recognize that the world has been infected by bad religions and bad wars. Now, more than ever, we need to turn to a good God. Look, it's true that impressionable baby boomers like me found many ways to make our opinions known. And in retrospect, after much reflection, I'd like to present a novel observation that I believe will define one long-lasting result of the chaos my generation helped to create. Perhaps that perfect storm, which culminated in race riots, war demonstrations, and massive political chaos, may have genuinely crippled the faith and conscience of many citizens. In fact, I believe one specific casualty from the war in Vietnam may have had the most profound impact on our culture. I am convinced that the American educational system has been permanently damaged. It was the Vietnam protest movement that most heavily impacted the academic world in ways that have never been rectified. You see, one result of the draft was that education became a tertiary goal for too many students. Learning was exchanged for a draft deferment, and it came with indoctrination. University and college campuses, well, they became crowded with some folks who were more dedicated to draft dodging than to math or science. And what followed was what I believe to be the downward spiral of morality and academic prowess. It also guaranteed the upward spike of draft-related enrollment into American colleges and universities. Higher education became the most viable alternative to jungle rot. As such, life at many colleges began reflecting the attitudes of those enrolled for reasons not connected to the academic process. Likewise, liberal schools and liberal professors found a well-paying captive audience ready to be turned against conventional wisdom and conservative issues. For these reasons and others, it shouldn't be any surprise that many anti-war demonstrations took place on college campuses. My personal opinion is that it didn't take too long for those running the educational system to realize that draft-age boys and unmarried young ladies were the largest potential customer base to whom they could market their services. And education is a business. By the way, if people want to complain about rising costs in this country, look at the cost of, uh, of higher education. I cannot understand how our government continues allowing these fully funded universities, liberal bastions of nonsense, to continue to just charge the exorbitant prices they do to indoctrinate our sons and daughters. It's madness. But regardless, every business must cater to its client base. Throughout 
most of the Vietnam War era, the students were largely against the war, and they were obviously therefore also against the draft. Many popular teachers were also opposed to the conflict in Southeast Asia. Eventually, radical elements matured within the system. They gained a powerful voice that can still be heard in today's reactionary environment. By 1968, violent chaos was erupting at college and universities across the nation. When some schools failed to cater to the political goals of the students, radical elements among the students took over some schools to further the political goals of the movement. Administration buildings were raided and suddenly controlled by the students. They took over. Entire college campuses were shut down in uncontrollable protests. Education was disrupted and replaced with the radical agendas of angry people. Student demonstrations crippled institutions until the radical views of the demonstrators were heard. Some, like the protest at a university in Ohio on the campus of Kent State, turned deadly. The press thrived on such chaos, while Crosby, Stills, and Nash memorialized the event in their anthem about the protest gone awry in Ohio. Vietnam became the most contentious topic in America. Me, most of my peers, we just wanted to skip boot camp and avoid G.I. Chow around napalm campfires. Thus, the war certainly impacted college enrollment and academic goals. I now believe that the lasting effects of liberalism and left-wing radicalism birthed during Vietnam continues to plague many campuses to this day. Anyone who saw the response to Israel's war in Gaza realized that the loudest anti-war outcries came from those bastions of uncontrolled freedom in the most liberal colleges and universities. This heritage of earlier decades is not a proud legacy, but it appears to be a lasting one. If you pay attention to the temperature of liberal students, liberal professors, and liberal universities, you will recognize that there has been a meteoric rise in anti-Semitism on America's college campuses, and that is something that demands our attention. From here, it's going to get a bit dicey. <laughs> I must turn our attention to a different war. There is a war going on for the souls of college students across America. This should have become clear to everyone. In 2024, after Hamas launched its October 7th war against Israel from Gaza, pro-Palestinian, pro-Hamas, anti-Israel college groups launched their own war against Jewish students, Israel, and Judaism, and they did it on college campuses across the nation. Are you aware that 73% of America's Jewish college students have personally experienced or personally witnessed forms of an on-campus anti-Semitism? Here in America, this is appalling. Some of our nation's wealthiest, most prestigious Ivy League campuses such as Harvard, MIT, Princeton, Stanford, Columbia, many other formerly well-respected schools have lost much of their respect due to being poisoned by radical, Arab-funded, Muslim-fueled, anti-Israel ideology promoted by pro-Palestinian student groups and anti-Semitic professors. Education has been lost on many campuses, and the dissemination of disgusting propaganda is what now remains to complete the indoctrination of a generation. This should be disturbing to all who value an educated populace. And, and I don't think the academic failure of our nation happened overnight. Perhaps it does go all the way back 
to end dodging the draft in the 1960s became the college goals of so many young men. Unfortunately, many modern parents haven't yet realized that though they have spent a fortune on tuition, some of their students stopped receiving a legitimate education. Instead, they have maybe accidentally sent their money to fund an academic system that simply manufactures more young, progressive, soon-to-be credentialed liberals. I guess we'll see how that works out. In the meantime, just in case the military draft is reinstated, if you want to avoid going to war or being drafted, in the concluding episode of this series, I will tell you exactly how we did it in the 1960s. And most crucial, I will definitely tell you what God thinks of war. Now, you may be quite surprised, so please come back next time. And until then, shalom, and thank you for joining me here at Crosstalk. By the way, I guess I should ask you what you think about all this stuff. I know it is not the usual fare on this program, the kind of things we normally discuss. I hope you will call or write to me and let me know your thoughts. After our next episode, we'll return to a more biblically flavored menu of content. But like some of you, I am tired of bad religion, bad politics, and bad wars. And I want to continue pointing friends and family to our good God. We do have enemies who hate us, but our good God loves us. Please do write to me. Crosstalk, P.O. Box 2528, Cedar Hill, Texas, 75106, USA. You can also reach me through my website, crosstalk.org. I do read all of my mail and I will gladly pray for any prayer requests you wish to send me. You can also call us toll free from anywhere in the U.S. at 1-800-688-3422. I hope you will call or write, and when you do, be sure to let me know your prayer request. Till next time, once again, shalom and remember, Jesus is Lord, and he was such a nice Jewish boy. <laughs> <laughs>